So it says, how do you share the gospel with someone who thinks good people go to heaven and have a relative or friend pass away that have not given their life to Christ? And then there's a follow-up question. I would never play God and tell them that their friend or relative isn't saved, but I wouldn't want to give them a false idea of how one is saved. Okay. So, um, so a couple of questions there. So first, the question about, well, how do you share the gospel with someone who thinks that good people go to heaven? Um, well, in one sense, I, I kind of agree. Uh, good people do go to heaven. <laughs> uh, the, the, the problem is, is that there, isn't any, there aren't any good people. Uh, in fact, the Bible talks a lot about this. So from a biblical Christian perspective, um, there is no one that is good. Uh, in fact, there's a whole, there's a verse on that. Romans 3 talks about, you know, there's no one righteous, no, not one. Um, and so I agree in that sense. Well, yeah, uh, a, a good person would go to heaven, but there aren't any good people. So that's the problem. Um, so in one sense, I agree with that point. Now, I would agree also with the idea that um, I typically will shy away from making pronouncements about who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven. Like, that's just not something that um, I would try to make an assessment about. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm just trying to avoid saying something that's politically incorrect. No, that's not the case. In fact, uh, I am comfortable sharing what I think Scripture says about people who would be saved or who would not be saved. And the Bible talks a lot about um, that particular question, right? I mean, the, the Bible is clear that um, God offers a pardon, of course, on his terms. And if you uh, participate in that pardon, if you agree with the terms of that pardon and, and satisfy the terms of that pardon, well, then you will be forgiven for the crimes you've committed against God. So, um, you know, I would be really clear about that's that people can go to heaven or the only way people go to heaven is by that way. Um, so I would, I would make that clear. Uh, and the Bible talks about that. So Romans 10 talks about, you know, if you confess with your mouth um, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, um, and of course, there's uh, other passages which say the opposite. In other words, like 1 Corinthians 6 talks about how um, uh, it says, do not be deceived. Uh, those who engage in unrighteous behavior will not be saved. And it goes through a whole list of people engaged in sinful, unrighteous behavior. And it says they will not be saved. So while I would not personally be involved in making pronouncements about, oh, this person's going to heaven and this person's not, I'm very comfortable saying, well, this is what the Bible says about who can enter into heaven, who cannot. And so, uh, again, I'll, I'll just make that clear. Um, now, this question here also talks about, um, it's asking, how would you then share the gospel with somebody who thinks that good people go to heaven? So in other words, if you were to share the gospel, all right, well, um, how would you do it to such a person? Well, I think that perhaps the problem that's happening there is this person thinks that there are good people or that they might be a good person. And so therefore, that's why they think they should go to heaven. And so what I would want to do would be to um, engage them and share with them the gospel in a way that is fresh and clear and different than what they often or the way they often hear it. So I'm sure you've all had this experience, but if you've ever been on an airplane, uh, before the airplane takes off, you have a flight attendant get up and they start giving you a safety presentation about how to wear a you know, seatbelt and you know what to do with the cabin pressure uh, has a problem, and so on and so forth. Well, if you've flown more than once in your life, most likely what you do when that happens is you just tune out. You're just like, you just hear the person talking, and they're talking like, wah, 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 wah. You're not, you're not listening. And the reason you're not listening is because you've heard those words over and over and over again. And they just, you just sort of don't listen. And I think too often, uh, when we Christians want to talk about the gospel or or share about Jesus, we often use language that is very common and familiar to us as Christians. And uh, it's often just sounds to a non-Christian as blah, 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 blah. Just the same words. Jesus died for your sins. Believe in Jesus. You know, you know, plead the blood of Christ or whatever it is. <laughs> and uh, they don't listen to it. So 
what I would encourage this person to do is to try to find a way to present the gospel in a way that is fresh and clear and new. And I don't mean new as in a different gospel. I just mean use language and words that are fresh and different. So um, uh, Greg Kokel, my, my boss, and of course the president of Standard Reason, uh, has a great way of doing this. He he suggests two questions, and actually I use the same two questions whenever I'm talking to a person. And here are the two questions. Number one, I ask them, do you believe people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished? Now, moral crime is like lying, cheating, stealing, you know. So do you believe people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished? And almost every time the person says to me, yeah, I do. And I respond with, so do I. Then I ask them the second question. I say, have you ever committed a moral crime? And, uh, you know, like lying, cheating, stealing, whatever. And they often say, well, yeah, I'm sure I'm not perfect. And I respond with, so do I, so have I. And then I say to them, I go, do you know what I call that? I, I, I call that bad news. <laughs> Why? Because we both just admitted that people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished. And we both just admitted that we've committed moral crimes. Therefore, we ought to be punished. So notice, do I have to tell this person now that they are a sinner or that they're not a good person? Well, no, they, they've just told me. Do I have to tell this person that they're under judgment? Well, no, not really, because they just told me. They just admitted that themselves. So notice, in this situation, I'm not looking down upon them in some sort of condescending way, uh, as if I'm the righteous Christian and they're the sinner, you know, the pagan sinner. No, I'm saying, I'm not standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. I'm standing shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with them, looking at this predicament that we're all in. Oh, man, people who commit crimes ought to be punished. We've just admitted we've committed crimes, therefore we ought to be punished. So I'm trying to demonstrate that I and every person on earth is in the same boat when it comes to um, how God sees us. And that is we've committed crimes against God. And, uh, and again, notice those two questions are, first of all, they're questions. So I'm, in trying to, I'm trying to engage the person using questions, which I think is more effective than just simply lecturing at them. But second of all, I'm, I'm bringing up this issue in a way that's different than they would typically would hear. Instead of saying, you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell for your sins or something like that. I'm using fresh language that's different, but I'm still trying to communicate the truth of the gospel. Now, once I've just described the bad news, then I'm willing to share with them the good news. And I'll say, hey, well, here's the, th here's the deal. Even though we're both under judgment, the good news is, is that the God who made us loves us. And he doesn't want us to be punished. So he's willing to offer a pardon. Now, the pardon is on his terms, but he is willing to offer a pardon for us to go free. And here's the terms of the pardon. God says, I will punish my son, Jesus, instead of you. But in return, you have to turn over the ownership of your life entirely to God. Now, what that means is you can accept the terms of that pardon and go free. Or you can pay for the crimes yourself, right? It's, it's your choice, right? So again, notice I have tried to share with the person that's asking this question about, you know, um, uh, sharing the gospel with someone who thinks good people go to heaven, right? And they've had, a, uh, had this friend pass away. And um, again, I'm trying to point out, look, all of us, no, there's no one good. We've all sinned. Even myself, I'd admit I've sinned and I deserve to be punished. And so by using those two questions, I'm engaging them using questions. I'm explaining the gospel in a way that avoids kind of Christianese, you know, that the language that's really common for people to hear. Uh, that's theologically loaded, but is typically incoherent to non-Christians because it's just the theologically loaded language that we get it. So I'm avoiding all that. Um, and so I'm avoiding the flight attendant sort of situation where you just hear this person just saying the same things. Jesus died for your sins. And it's almost meaningless to people. I'm trying to figure out a way to communicate the gospel in a way that's fresh and different.